Hello and welcome to the final lecture on George Orwell's Shooting the Elephant, which we are covering in his NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies. Now, we had already covered a significant section of the essay, and today we just want to conclude the essay by looking at the final section. Uh, and obviously, the key questions that the essay asks are the relationship between cultural identity and agency, which we have spent some time already on, dwelling on. So, this essay, as I mentioned in a couple of lectures previously, it's a dramatization, it's a drama about the crisis of agency uh, in a particular cultural condition, uh, the crisis of identity formation in a particular cultural formation. So we talked about how uh, the hegemonic identity over here becomes, uh, sort of comes to be consumed uh, by its own hegemony, how the hegemonic identity becomes powerless uh, precisely because it's powerful, because you know, if you're powerful all the time, if you're expected uh, to be powerful all the time, then you end up being powerless because you don't have the option of not being powerful. This is what the essay dramatizes in a very spectacular way. And there is a associated claustrophobia that comes with uh, agency lessness, uh, the associated neurotism. Uh, it's a very neurotic kind of an essay, uh, which, you know, uh, it becomes more and more nervous, it becomes more and more ambivalent, the narrator becomes more and more ambivalent. And obviously, as I mentioned, this is a much older Orwell looking back uh, retrospectively at a much younger Orwell. Uh, and so it's a much older, more mature self commenting on something which happened many years before when he was relatively uh, inexperienced and callow and didn't quite know what to do. So this is the final bit of the essay which is on your screen right now. Uh, this is where he's looking at the elephant and this is where he's sort of speculating whether or not to shoot the elephant and he realizes increasingly that he ought not to shoot the elephant because the elephant is perfectly harmless and its attack of must, which is the hormonal excitement which he was ex experiencing, is going away and is beginning to become tame and domestic and harmless again. And all that will take now is for the Mahout to come back and take it back. Uh, but then he looks back and realizes that he is surrounded by people uh, who are expecting him to shoot the elephant because he had sort of committed himself to the act the moment he called for the rifle and the moment he walked down the town with the rifle in his hand. So again, this is going back to um, something which you have perhaps explored already, uh, the construction of a signifier, uh, the signifier of white male supremacy. Uh, when a white man walks out with a gun in a colonial space, it, it is, there's an automatic assumption uh, of you know, the performance of power, the articulation, the iteration of power. And if you don't do it, if you come to that point in uh, walking down town with a gun as a white man, and then you walk back without committing, without enacting the act, uh, then you end up really uh, compromising the entire structure of power. And that's something which is uh, more, you know, more, more uh, helpful to protect. It's more uh, important to protect rather than individual agency. So individual agency becomes completely redundant, and you know, it becomes you know, secondary, tertiary, uh, absolutely redundant compared to these, the macro agency of power. So just going back to the essay, and uh, this is a section where we're, where we're looking at how uh, he begins to become afraid, uh, but he's not afraid because of his own personal safety. He's not afraid because uh, he thinks he might be killed by the elephant, which is perfectly possible. He's afraid, rather, that he'll be found out uh, to be not a brave man. He'll be found out to be, uh, you know, not to be an intrepid Englishman, uh, not to be an intrepid colonized, colonizer person, uh, but actually as an ambivalent, nervous, neurotic person, that, that he doesn't want to be found out. And that's the primary fear. Uh, in the essay, that I don't want to be found out uh, to be a nervous man because you know, if you're found out as a nervous man, the entire construct, the entire signifier of the Sahib uh, gets compromised, and that's something which he can't um, you know, afford to sort of let happen. Okay, so uh, this is a section where he says, Even then, I was not thinking uh, particularly of my own skin, only of the watchful yellow faces behind. For at that moment, with a crowd watching me, I was not afraid in the ordinary sense, as I would be if I had been alone. So if he were alone uh, in front of an elephant with a gun, uh, his primary fear would be for his own safety, his primary fear would be for his own security, his bodily safety, bodily security. But over here, uh, there is a greater fear at stake, there's a greater protection at stake, uh, you know, and that is he is fearing the protection, he is afraid that he will only be able to protect not the safety of his own skin, but the safety of the construct of the supremacy of the white man. That becomes more important, that becomes a more important construct to be protected, rather than the biological safety of his own self. So this is what he says, and this is a very important quotation from the essay, where he says, a white man mustn't be frightened in front of the natives, and so in general he isn't frightened. 
The sole thought in my mind was that if anything went wrong, those 2,000 Burmans would see me pursued, caught, trampled on, and reduced to a grinning corpse like an Indian up the hill. And if that happened, it was quite probable that some of them would laugh. That would never do. So again, see the reference to the grinning corpse of the Indian, which had appeared before. It was a very morbid image, a uh, grotesque image of a man uh, sort of uh, crushed into the ground and obviously killed in the process and ends up grinning as a corpse. It's almost like a grotesque, uh, a perverse parody uh, of the solemnity of death, of the solemnity of burial, etc. And he's saying over here that if the elephant does the same thing with me, then I'll be reduced to the grinning corpse uh, as that Indian up the hill. And that would never do because then the people around me would laugh at me. And again, the whole point comes back uh, not so much about the protection of his own skin, protection of his own biological body, but of the ideological body around him, the discursive body around him, which obviously promotes the supremacy of the white man. And that, that supremacy must not be compromised before this um, crowd which had gathered behind him. So, in other words, um, a spectacle has been created, and now the spectacular act must be uh, done. You know, and the spectacular act, obviously, is the shooting of the elephant. Now, I did mention at some point previously that this becomes in a very uh, grotesque sense, a parody of the imperial hunting narrative. Uh, the imperial hunting narrative was sort of designed uh, to sort of promote the supremacy of the white man. It was designed to uh, sort of promote the uh, machismo of the white man. Uh, you know, the white man you know, capturing and hunting the wild animal became some kind of an allegory of colonialism to a certain extent. Now, obviously, this is not something which is similar, but there's a structural similarity, but at the same time, it's functionally completely different, thematically and essentially completely different. It doesn't want to show the uh, elephant, which is not even wild. It's a domestic elephant which has become momentarily mad. And he realizes that, you know, there's no point in shooting him. It's completely useless, barbaric, inhuman to shoot the elephant. But he has to because the crowd around him has gathered and the people around him, uh, and he described them in very racist terms, uh, yellow faces, a yellow crowd of people behind him. And they all gathered with the expectation, with the sole expectation that he was going to shoot the elephant now. And now there's only going back from this point. So the whole idea over here is not to become a laughable subject an object of laughter, right? Uh, the white man must never be laughed at. The white man must be worshipped all the time. The white man must be obeyed all the time. Now, that discourse, that narrative of being obeyed, of being worshipped, uh, obviously is a construct of colonialism. Now, that construct must be protected at all costs. Now, even if that means you have to go against your agency, even if that means you have to go against your own human will, uh, so be it. Uh, and that's the whole idea uh, of cultural construction. And that's the reason why we're looking at this essay so carefully, because uh, the Culture that constructs your identity, the constructions of identity often come at the cost of your personal will, of your personal biological uh, existential will, uh, which sometimes have to be subverted, uh, negated, uh, made redundant in order for the, the, the bigger cultural signifier uh, to, be, to be enacted. And over here, that's exactly what's happening. The bigger cultural signifier is a white man, the white sahib. And that becomes more important, that becomes more important, a far more important construct that needs protection rather than a man, George Orwell, uh, you know, who is completely uh, replaceable by any other white man. He's just a white man, but the white man is a white man. And a white man must behave like a white man. Uh, if he doesn't behave like a white man, he compromises the entire colonial machinery, and that must never happen. In other words, he must never be laughed at. Okay, because laughing at would really be um, a complete destruction uh, of the discourse of uh, supremacy, um, you know, heroism, machismo that a white man is expected to enact in a colonial space. Okay, so uh, there was only one alternative. I shoved the cartridges into the magazine and lay down on the road to get a better aim. Now, obviously, Owe is doing something which goes entirely against his own will. He doesn't want to shoot the elephant, but he doesn't have any option. So there's just one alternative. He's forced to commit himself to the act. The crowd grew very still, and a deep, low, happy sigh, as the people who see the theatre curtain go up at last, breathe from innumerable throats. So again, look at the metaphors over here. The metaphors here are completely theatrical, which basically is a pointer to the performativity of the whole act. It's a very performative act. Uh, it's performative because it's not, you know, it's excessive, it's larger than life, uh, it is spectacular in quality, and it is designed to create a certain effect. Right? The effect over here is one of heroism. The effect over here is the supremacy of the white man. Uh, you know, the awe that one must have uh, for the white man. That must be you know, produced, that effect must be produced out of this particular act. 
So the, the behavior of the crowd here is very reflective uh, of the idea of consumption. So the crowd over here has come to consume the supremacy of the white man. It's, it becomes a bit of a circus show, a spectacular circus show, a real life circus really, where the white man comes, he performs an act which is performative uh, in the sense that it's excessive, designed to generate an effect, etc. Uh, and the people around him, the crowd around him, they've come to consume uh, the effect of the particular act. So. The theatre metaphors over here are very deliberately and strategically chosen by the narrator in order to really give you the sense of the full impact of what he was going through at that point of time. They were going to have the bit of fun after all. So the bit of fun over here, the tamasha over here, is basically the white man doing something that a white man must do. Kill an elephant, kill something which is potentially anarchic. So all the people have come together and, uh, and, and sort of they're expecting him to shoot the elephant and they've come together to consume uh, the spectacular quality of the act. So the bit of fun over here is a spectacular quality, the performative quality of the actor shooting the elephant, which obviously is something that does completely going against his own will. Uh, the rifle was a beautiful German thing with crosshair sights. I do not know then that in shooting an elephant, one would shoot uh, to cut an imaginary bar running from ear hole to ear hole. I ought therefore, as the elephant was sideways on, to have aimed straight at the ear hole. Actually, I aimed several inches in front of this, thinking the brain would be further forward. So, you know, he's giving you a very graphic description uh, of the point of contact that he made with the with this with this shooting. He realizes now, and this is again an example of retrospective narration. He's sort of looking back at the whole idea, the whole event, and telling you the things which had gone wrong, which could have gone wrong, uh, revealing to you his inexperience at that point of time. Right? So he shot at the wrong point. He did not shoot at the ideal point while shooting an elephant. He says one ought to shoot a point at a particular you know, place in the elephant's anatomy. He obviously targeted somewhere else. As a result of it, something went wrong. The elephant did not really die the way he would have died normally. Right, and again, if we look at the and we look at the uh, description of the death of the elephant, uh, he ends up shooting the elephant, but not killing the elephant, and therein lies the difference. So that's the reason why they say it's called shooting an elephant. So again, that that dichotomy, the gap between shooting and killing, that also reveals uh, his lack of agency. He comes and shoots the elephant, but he doesn't really kill it. The elephant dies much later. It dies a very gradual, painful death. Uh, a very slow, gradual, painful death. And again, uh, there's a point in the essay where he keeps shooting the elephant to help it die, but the elephant doesn't die uh, because, you know, he's shooting the wrong places. And again, that is reflective of the crisis of his agency. I mean, it doesn't really have an agency. It comes and shoots the elephant, but doesn't really kill it, right? And it becomes very grotesque, uh, very perverse parody uh, of agency in a colonial space. Okay, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. And now he is describing the entire the experience, the phenomenal experience of really shooting the elephant and how we felt at that point of time. When I pulled the trigger, I did not hear the bang or feel the kick. One never does when a shot goes home. But I heard the devilish roar of glee that went out from the crowd. So again, look at the metaphors, devilish. The, the, uh, Burma, the Burmese people are devilish by default. The yellow faces, you know, they are monsters, they are subhuman species. Again, the rhetoric way is very racist, but then of course we have to understand that this is written at a time uh, when, you know, racism wasn't really, uh, you know, looked down upon. It was completely sanctioned. Uh, this is a colonial officer talking about the, the colonized native people. It doesn't have to be politically correct. And this particular essay is not meant to be read by um, the Asians later on, but people like us today. Uh, we are looking at it and critiquing it and, and uh, realizing how racist it is. But then uh, the, the politically important point of the essay is the fact that it's so politically incorrect, as I mentioned before, that, you know, he doesn't really care. Uh, he's telling you exactly how he felt. So on one hand, he's telling you imperialism is a, is a terrible thing. It's a barbaric activity. It's an entire enterprise of exploitation. There's nothing noble about it. But at the same time, he's also telling you the people around us uh, and the Burmese people or Asian people over here are completely devilish people, yellow-faced people with no sense of direction, uh, no sense of propriety, etc. So, you know, this is what I mean when I said at the beginning, he stopped it in two orders of hatred. One, a bigger ideological hatred and a more immediate visceral hatred, right? So he's not really being politically correct at all. So the devilish row of glee that went off from the crowd. In that instant, in too short a time, one would have thought, even for the bullet to get there, a mysterious, terrible change had come over the elephant. He neither stirred nor fell, but every line of his body had altered. He looked suddenly stricken, shrunken, immensely old. 
as though the frightful impact of the bullet had paralyzed him without knocking him down. At last, after what seemed a long time, it might have been five seconds, I dare say, he sagged flabbly on his knees. His mouth slobbered. An enormous senility seemed to have settled upon him. One could have imagined him thousands of years old. So what happens over here is very interesting. It gives you a very decelerated description of the dying elephant. Everything slows down. There's a process of retardation that happens over here. Uh, everything becomes magnified. It's like a slow motion in cinema, right? Where things are slowed down, magnified for effect. And we have the same kind of an effect over here in this particular section of the essay, where he describes in very graphic and gory details how the elephant was gradually dying. So it did not stop. He just began to slobber after a point of time, and then it began to look very senile, as if great senility had descended on him. Uh, and his body changed, his appearance changed completely, and it became more and more weak, it became more and more sort of uh, flabby. And he sort of, at the end of it, after many seconds, it may have been five seconds in terms of clock time, but it seemed to him an infinity, uh, an infinite stretch of time, where the elephant began to fall gradually. Uh, I fired again into the same spot. At a second shot, he did not collapse, but climbed with desperate slowness to his feet and stood weakly upright, with legs sagging and head drooping. I fired a third time. That was a shot that did for him. You could see the agony of it jolt his whole body and knock the last remnant of strength from his legs. But in falling, he seemed for a moment to rise, for as his, my, as his hind legs collapsed beneath him, he seemed to tower uh, upward like a huge rock toppling, his trunk reaching skyward like a tree. He trumpeted for the first and only time, and then down he came, his belly towards me, with a crash that seemed to shake the ground, even where I lay. Now, it is possible for us to read this entire episode as a very interesting allegory, a very complex and grotesque allegory of the annihilation of agency. I mean, the dying elephant becomes his dying agency. So there seems to be some kind of an empathy between him and the elephant at this point of time. Uh, he seems to connect to the elephant and he seems to be really moved by the dying elephant, uh, even as he's shooting the elephant. So in a way, the elephant becomes, the dying elephant becomes really an allegory, really an extension, an exteriorization of his dying agency uh, at this point of time. And he can sort of connect to it and he can feel the pain and it's a very painful process for him as well because the elephant keeps on dying. It doesn't really die immediately, it takes an enormous amount of time to die. And that again is the dichotomy, that, that schism I talked about a little while uh, earlier. The difference between shooting and killing. He keeps shooting the elephant, but then at a point in time comes when shooting, his shots make no difference at all. The elephant was dying in his own time, uh, and his shots you know, failed to make any difference at that point in time. Right, so the elephant crushed and, you know, it seemed to shake the ground beneath his feet and, you know, and he could see the very decelerated, slowed motion of the elephant dying in front of him. And like I said, it may have been five seconds in terms of clock time, but that doesn't matter. You know, what really matters is the psychological time that he's inhabiting at, a, at that, that stage. And the entire essay is a retrospective narration, but he manages to recapture the, the entire experiential, uh, experientiality of the event. Right, the entire experience of what he went through at that point of time. I got up. Uh, the Burmans were already racing past me across the mud. It was obvious that the elephant would never rise again, but he was not dead. And this is the whole point. He, he did not die immediately, but he was dying. Right, And the difference between dying and being dead over here is dramatized. That, that, that gap has been dramatized deliberately by Owen. He was breathing very rhythmically with l long, rattling gasps. His great mound of a side painfully rising and falling. His mouth was wide open. I could see far down into caverns of pale pink throat. So the descriptions become more and more graphic. And also look at the, um, uh, the way he's humanizing the elephant, you know, the pronouns, the heads, the bodily anatomy is described in a way as if the human anatomy and, you know, it becomes almost a murder for him, right? And the word murder does appear in the essay. Right. There's a difference between murder and killing. Now, if you murder someone, there's a degree of, you know, the, the automatic implication is it's a human being you're killing, right? It's an act of crime. It's an act of sin, perhaps, if you look at it from a more, you know, sacred, you know, religious perspective. But over here, the word murder had also appeared, which goes on to show that the extent to which he was unwilling to carry out this particular act. Okay. Uh, so you could see, I could see far down into caverns of pale pink throne. I waited for a long time for him to die, but his breathing did not weaken. Finally, I fired my two remaining shots into the spot where I thought his heart must be. 
but take blood's well out of him like red velvet, but still he did not die. His body did not even jerk when the shots hit him, and the tortured breathing continued without a pause. He was dying, very slowly and in great agony, but in some world remote from me, where even not even a bullet could damage him further. And this is the point where the dramatization between shooting and killing begins to become very apparent. Now he's wanting to shoot the elephant, he wants to kill the elephant, you know, just relieve the elephant from his agony, but he can't do it. And he keeps on fighting, he keeps on, sh he keeps on firing, he keeps on shooting, but that doesn't make any difference at all because he says the elephant is dying in some of the world where not even my bullets can touch him any further. Now this again becomes a very paradoxical crisis of agency. Now at this point of time, he wants to kill the elephant. Um, he, he wants to get rid of the elephant in the sense that he wants the elephant to be relieved of this agony, this very painful process of dying. But he can't seem to make any difference at all. And this idea of not being able to make any difference, that extends uh, the entire crisis of agency that the essay is dramatizing at this point of time. Now he's a white man with a gun. He's notionally the supreme person, the supreme signifier of power. But look at his powerlessness. Uh, a, he's forced to do something he doesn't want to do. He's forced to shoot an elephant. He doesn't want to shoot the elephant, but he has to do it. That's powerlessness once. And secondly, and more grotesquely, he now wants to kill the elephant because he wants to relieve the elephant of his agony and he can't do it uh, because he keeps shooting the elephant in the wrong places uh, and elephant doesn't die. It just takes a lot of time uh, and the entire process of dying is magnified and decelerated and slows down and that becomes more graphic for him, that becomes more psychologically unnerving for him and that unsettles him even more. Okay, So this idea of dying and being dead. Uh, that has been dramatized and that further extends his crisis of agency which has been dramatized throughout this essay. Okay, so I felt that I had to got, I had got to put an end to that dreadful noise. It seemed uh, dreadful to see the great bees lying there powerless to move and yet powerless to die. So again the word powerless appears twice and as I mentioned the powerlessness of the elephant becomes an exteriorization of the powerlessness of Orwell, the man away. So there's a degree of empathy that he connects, he establishes with the elephant. That you know, the elephant was powerless to die, it was powerless to live, it was powerless to die, it's stuck in a very liminal, limbo state between life and death. But at the same time, he's not really either of these two, he's not going to live again, but he's not dying yet, right? So he's not dead yet, so he's dying. So there's a process of becoming and unbecoming that is happening away up. And one could read uh, the existential location of Orwell in very similar terms, right? So he doesn't want to be there, he didn't want to shoot the elephant, but at the same time he had shot the elephant, but he did not kill the elephant. So again, he's somewhere stuck between, you know, different categories of action and he doesn't quite know how to locate himself. So his dislocation and the elephant's liminality between life and death are somehow connected at a structural level and that makes them uh, more empathetic towards the elephant at this point. Right, so, um, I sent back from a small rifle and poured shot after shot into his heart and down his throat. They seemed to make no impression. The tortured gasp continued as steadily as the ticking of a clock. Right. So the ticking of a clock is like a little uh, in a passage of time, and the tortured breathing of the elephant continued like ticking of the clock. And his, you know, incessant shooting of the elephant didn't make any difference at all at this point in time. So he called for a smaller rifle. It went, you know, very close to the elephant pour the shots into his mouth one after the other but that didn't make any difference at all right and again this becomes yeah, a spectacular example of his crisis of agency that he wants to kill the elephant now but he can't do it right so he's shot, he shot the elephant but that's about it really he's supposed to shoot the elephant and then that's it his, his, uh, his agency has been enacted and now any further act uh, you know doesn't make any difference and that makes him even more agency less and his agency lessness becomes very, very spectacular and very evident at this point of time. Okay, in the end, I could not stand it any longer and went away. I heard later that it took him half an hour to die. The Burmans were bringing dash and buskers even before I left, and I was told they had stripped his body almost to the bones by the afternoon. So the Burmese people apparently came and stripped the elephant to his bones and took away all the meat. Uh, and again, the description of the Burmese people over here, a uh, sort of quasi-cannibalistic culture, is very problematic. You know, you know, he seems to know exactly uh, what everyone, uh, every one of these Burmese people want, what what each of these Burmese people want. He seemed to know exactly that they all wanted to shoot the elephant. He seemed to know exactly they all wanted to meet the elephant. Now, this totalizing assumptions is very, very problematic. And you know, like I said, uh, no Burmese men or women speak in this essay. 
um, there's no Burmese voice over here. It's entirely a white man's idea of Burmese culture. It's entirely a white man's idea of Burmese desire. And he's just assuming and totalizing and describing, uh, you know, speaking for the Burmese, right? So we need to be cautious about taking this essay uh, uh, in too liberal a light. Right? There are problems in this essay. There are some definite degrees of racism in the essay, if you're measuring by modern standards, that we need to be aware of. You know, we need to be guarded uh, you know, before becoming too celebratory uh, of, you know, oh well, the left-wing intellectual way. Yeah. Because what he is doing essentially is, is, is essentializing. Uh, he is speaking for the Burmese. He's describing the Burmese in very totalizing terms. And he's, uh, he seems to know exactly what the Burmese want, what the Burmese did. Uh, and there's no complexity. All the complexity, all the ambivalence, all the uncertainty, the attractive ambivalence and uncertainty are located entirely in the white man. Right? There's no uncertainty that is conferred or given or offered or you know, used to describe the Burmese people. Uh, he's absolutely certain of what the Burmese people are, what they want, what they've done, exactly, and etc. And that is deeply problematic, uh, discursive, racist, ideological, cultural levels. I need to be aware of that be before we become uh, too celebratory of this essay. Right. Uh, and then we conclude this essay, uh, the last section. Afterwards, of course, there were endless discussions about the shooting of the elephant. The owner was furious, but he was only an Indian and could do nothing. Again, the question of agency comes in. Uh, this is notional agency at work, theoretical agency at work, right? Uh, the owner of the elephant was an Indian and could do nothing because he was just an Indian. But we all already seen that the white man, who was notionally full of agency, also could do nothing but had to shoot the elephant. Right? So the question of agency had been turned on its head, and we had seen how the entire essay had described it or dramatized it. But now we're back to being notional, we're back to being normative. Right? Uh, the act has been done, um, the rupture has happened, and now the schemes have been sewn in again. Right? And now the owner, oh, being an Indian, is notionally agency-less. Oh well, the white man is notionally full of agency. So the notional parameters, the normative parameters are sort of brought back again. They have been restored again. Besides, legally, I had done the right thing. For a mad elephant has to be killed like a mad dog if its owner fails to control it. Among the Europeans, opinion was divided. The older man said that I was right. The younger man said it was a damn shame to shoot an elephant for killing a coolie because an elephant was worth more than any damn Karingi coolie. Uh, this division is important. The younger men over here, uh, they take it at a very literal level. They say the elephant costs more than a coolie. So you should not have shot the elephant. You should not have killed the elephant. It was a damn shame you killed the elephant because what is a coolie compared to an elephant? Now, the older men, they seem to have said that you do the right thing by shooting the elephant. Now, there, there's a very interesting reading you can do about it. Uh, we talked about reification already, uh, the Marxist idea of reification or commodification. Now. There are two commodities at stake over here. The first commodity is what the younger white men want to protect, and that is the, the cost of the elephant, right? And they are comparing the commodity cost at a very literal, surface, superficial level, right? And they're saying uh, the elephant costs more than a coolie, so you should have protected the elephant more than you protected the coolie. The older men over here, who would spend more time in the colonial space, who are presumably wiser, they say you've done the right thing by shooting the elephant because they realize that the greater commodity at stake over here is the supremacy of the white man. That is a meta commodity which is priceless and that must be protected at, at all costs, right? So the, the suggestion over here is you do the right thing as a white man to shoot the elephant because you, you protected the commodity status, the hyper commodity and the meta commodity status of the white man's supremacy. And that needs to be protected above and beyond any other commodity in the colonial space, right? So they, they say it was the right thing to do. So that was a division and that division is quite uh, revealing. It, it, it sort of reveals before us uh, a very superficial idea of commodity and a more deep, a more sinister idea of commodification, which is at work in a colonial space. Right. And afterwards, I was very glad that the coolie had been killed. It put me legally in the right and gave me a sufficient pretext for shooting the elephant. So, you know, he said all the boxes have been taken, the coolie had been killed by the elephant. So, obviously, I was legally in the right in terms of shooting the elephant and the right thing, legally speaking. I often wondered whether any of the others grasped that I had done it solely to avoid looking a fool. And that's the final sentence which, with which the essay ends. And the whole idea is, you know, he realizes, he sort of tells himself that I, I, 
I, I, I hope no one found out that I shot the elephant primarily because I didn't want to be found out to be a fool, right? Because I didn't want to be laughed at. I didn't want to be mocked at, jeered at. I wanted to protect my respect. I wanted to protect my um, signifier status as a white man, right? And this idea uh, of being a fool, this idea of being found out as a fool, uh, reveals before us the hollowness of the construct of the white man's supremacy. And the entire, I, the entire essay becomes a dramatization of the hollowness. He realizes it's a very hollow construct. He realizes an entire idea of supremacy of the white man. It's a very superficial construct which has been replicated endlessly and has become permanent uh, in a colonial space, but actually it can crack up every second, any second, right? So the entire idea, the entire episode of shooting the elephant, having to do it and going against his own will, that had revealed before him uh, the constructed quality of the white man's supremacy, which is actually something which can crack up any second, right? He came very close to cracking up. He came very close uh, to so realizing that he's basically been stripped off uh, the, the security of a signifier status. And then he realizes in the end that, you know, I had only done the act, I'd only shot the elephant in order to avoid looking like a fool. And I wondered whether anyone else had found out that as well. So, uh, and this concludes the essay. Now, uh, this is the section, this, these are references that are useful for you in terms of quoting or citing. And if you want to read any further, there are the collected essays in journalism and letters of George Orwell, which you can read. Uh, there are quite a few essays on Burma, of his experiences in Burma as a colonial police officer that might be very useful, very interesting for you to read uh, for this particular course. Now, the reason why we did this essay in such details in this course, uh, obviously, this is a great essay about uh, cultural construction of, of identities. Uh, so we look at identity and cultural conditions. Uh, this essay becomes a very graphic reminder of how identities are constructed, reconstructed, and sometimes potentially deconstructed uh, in certain cultural conditions. And how when the conditions change, the identities would also change. And how identities um, sort of come with certain baggage of expectations, uh, performative expectations, expectations of enacting certain performances which must be carried out uh, because you become a, a carrier of certain identities and those identities demand certain uh, certain actions from you, certain events from you, certain performances from you, right? And if you don't carry out those performances, you you know you end up compromising your identity. So the very uh, the very flimsy, the very superficial idea of identity uh, is dramatized in this particular essay. The whole idea of supremacy, superior identity, uh, is basically a construct and a very, very hollow construct. So the entire essay is about hollowness. Uh, the, the, the oral persona over here is not someone that you should hear or worship, is not someone that you should celebrate and look up to. He's a very cynical, hollow, hypocritical man, right? For all his um, uh, hatred against imperialism, for all his hatred against the empire and you know, the exploitative machinery of imperialism, he ends up doing what imperialism wants him to do because he's on the payroll of the imperial uh, machinery, right? So with all his cynicism, with all his ambivalence, with all his uh, uncertainty, he ends up replicating what every white man must do in a colonial space, with the difference that it gives you an idea as a reader uh, what, he, what he went through at that point of time, what the uncertainty, the ambivalence, uh, the agony he went through at that point of time. But at the end, he ended up doing it. So uh, the entire revelation, the entire epiphany uh, became quite purposeless in the end, it became quite superfluous in the end. So the entire essay become a, a, a drama of superfluity, of hollowness, of hypocrisy, right, of cynicism. Uh, to a great extent. And again, the problems in the essay, as I mentioned already, that no Burmese men or women are given a voice uh, in this essay. The entire essay is narrated by a white man who seems to know exactly uh, what the Burmese people wanted, what the Burmese people expected, and that becomes quite problematic in terms of the representational politics that the essay uh, sort of uh, appropriates. So I hope you enjoyed the essay. I hope you found the essay useful in terms of looking at how uh, cultural studies, a very serious study of culture, can reveal to us uh, how identities, agency, uh, you know, social performances, cultural performances are enacted in different conditions, uh, oftentimes going against uh, the will of the self, going against the instinct of the biological body, uh, how the cultural will, how the sort of the political will, the social will, discursive will, these become more important than the biological instincts of self-preservation, fear, etc. Right? So we conclude this essay uh, and then we move on to the next text in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next lecture.